Hey everybody, welcome back to the big board. I thought we'd have a look at the Granicus today. Uh, May 334 BC, no less. Great Battles of Alexander from GMT. And what I thought I might do, uh, because I've always found this interesting and hope you might as well, is uh, in the past I've done some readings from various historical authors like Arian or Diodorus or whatever the case may be. And sometimes you can read those or hear them and it doesn't really give you a lot of insight into perhaps what what exactly was meant by some of the wording. And so sometimes it's better to read what the commentators have to say about what the original authors were doing and what they meant and what their intent was. What's even better than that is rather than having to read four or five weighty tomes on the analysis of uh, the Greek interpretation versus, uh, uh, you know, the Greek to Latin versus the Latin to, you know, whatever else uh, from German to something, uh, uh, language uh, influences on the usage of words and things like that. Sometimes it's nice to read a commentary uh, about the whole thing and uh, helps it put it in context and allows simple folk like myself to perhaps garner a, a greater appreciation for the, the specific battle or the tactics that we used or what the writers were thinking and what they what their PhDs in archaeology and history have uh, their insights a little more understanding about their insights so I have an article here from ancient warfare uh, looks like it's uh, uh, volume two uh, edition number seven and it's uh, written by Duncan Campbell. <clears throat> and I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I am going to read a significant portion of it because I think it's very interesting. And we'll, we'll see how this all goes. Hopefully you'll find some of it interesting and we're going to go from there. Uh, and I'm going to kind of jump in and out of the article, but basically the opening uh, talks about what was Alexander's, uh, what really happened at the River Granicus. Alexander's Great Cavalry Battle. So that probably puts it in the context of we'll be discussing the battle, but also the, the what the different historians thought, the geography, the, the tactics used, and, and what, in essence, what happened. So let's have a look. On the map, you can see here on the left, uh, the red units are Alexander's forces, and the blue units are the uh, satraps, uh, the combination of the various satraps' uh, forces. Uh, arrayed per Arian's uh, interpretation of the battle, which was that the cavalry were all uh, up against the bank of the river and that the Greek uh, mercenaries and other levies were in the rear on a hill and that uh, they. this is how the battle began. There are obviously a number of interpretations, so let's get after it, eh? So in the spring of 334 BC, Alexander the Great, then age 21, crossed into Asia Minor at the head of a 35,000 strong Macedonian army to begin the conquest of the Persian Empire. Uh, however, our main sources of information disagree on the course of the battle and given only a vague idea of the terrain. So it's possible for us uh, over two millennia, is it possible for us over two millennia later to trace exactly what happened at the River Granicus? And one of the interesting things, well, I'll put some pictures up uh, as this goes along. I had a look at the geography on Google Maps, and I'll share some of that with you so you can see exactly where this battle took place and get a feel for why this was probably, why the battle happened where it did, which is pretty interesting. Uh, travelers uh, crossing the Dardanelles into Asia Minor uh, arrived first at Biga Peninsula. Uh, known in antiquity as Troad, T-R-O-A-D. Their way is blocked by the massif of Mount Ida, which must be skirted to the north or south. And those who choose the south-southern route must cross the river Scam Scamander in the neighborhood of Troy. While those, those who go north eventually will find their way barred by the river Granicus. And uh, the uh, that is uh, a, there's a township there called Biga K. It was uh, this northern route that Alexander's army took in 334. The historian Arian uh, records that Alexander advanced ready for battle with his infantry phalanx in two blocks, one behind the other and his cavalry on the flanks, which is a pretty typical uh, formation that uh, 
the, the uh, Greeks were advancing. I've got the cat coming in to join us. Uh, the Persians, meantime, were well aware of Alexander's approach and had assembled an army near Zelia, uh, comprised of uh, 20,000 cavalry and a similar number of infantry, a similar body of Greek mercenaries as well. Anticipating uh, Alexander's route, they moved west and drew up their army on the right bank of the Granicus. Let's see. Uh, let's see. So I'm receiving reports. Uh, the Macedonian scouts scoured the area, and uh, this is where we get our first uh, conflict between the different authors, you know, historical authors, Diodor Diodorus and Arian, uh, because uh, Armenian, who was uh, one of Alexander's generals, uh, suggested to Alexander that they should halt for the night and launch a dawn assault across the river. But the impetuous Alexander having, was having none of that, and uh, he, uh, having just crossed the Hellespont, uh, said he was not going to be intimidated by a little stream. And that was quoted out of Arian 1.13.6. He immediately prepared for battle. And so uh, you know, Diodorus has a different version of that, and that they did indeed uh, camp out for the night. And uh, there's some exaggerations or misrepresentations of facts in terms of numbers of troops because we're looking at hundreds of thousands of infantry for the Persians and lots and lots of cavalry uh, and all sorts of uh, different bits and pieces like that, which if you've done any reading on Alexander the Great and any ancient battle, you'll know that the victor always uh, exaggerates the number of the enemy that they defeated. Anyway... Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll go back over to here. So, Theodorus appeared to envisage that the Persian encampment began some distance east of the river so that Alexander could reasonably have expected to cross unopposed at dawn. However, we may doubt whether the young general would have thought it wise to delay his attack until the morning. And here's an interesting fact, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase the next couple of paragraphs, uh, the rationale is that by quickly uh, approaching the river and advancing to attack across it in the afternoon rather than resting the troops after a long, day, a long day's march, uh, he wanted to have the sun in the eyes of the defenders versus having the sun in the eyes of his troops as they crossed the river. And you can well appreciate that having the sun in your eyes when you're trying to dodge a blade or a spear or sarissa or even just, you know, uh, trying to assess what the enemy's movements are, that could be a significant advantage. So there's a tactical reason why Alexander may well have decided to conduct his attack off the march as as was written by Arian. And I, that's the first time I'd actually read that and, and considered that. And you don't appreciate that until you actually have a look at the map in context of the, of the larger area and which directions uh, everyone's facing. So I thought that was pretty interesting. We'll skip the quote out of Arian and uh, we'll move on to uh, discuss... Uh, uh, now, Plutarch uh, is, is uh, quoted here as well as he draws attention to the depth of the river and the unevenness and ruggedness of the uh, opposite bank, which would have, have to be negotiated in the midst of combat. However, the remainder of his account is embarrassingly bombastic. <laughs> in order to exaggerate Alexander's achievement, a consideration of the terrain shows that the river was far less formidable <clears throat> than uh, he would have us believe. There is now a, a long column here that discusses the battlefield. And uh, there were a number of visits uh, by folk in uh, uh, antiquity, but also in the early 1970s and 71, 74. There were a number of books written uh, by Pro uh, Professor Kenneth Hall and some other folks, uh, Professor Nicholas Hammond, uh, that wrote uh, about the width and depth of the river. And in some cases, there are actually photographs you can see of, of horses that were in the 70s uh, that were only uh, fetlock deep in, in the water and based on the geographic and uh, uh, I guess other archaeological assessments the course of the river has is basically unchanged uh, across the millennia which is pretty interesting as well uh, there's a marshy lake that's further north 
so this uh, so this direction and further north there's a marshy lake and behind uh, the forces here to the to the bottom of the screen there's, there's a, a river that splits into uh, two sections and that that for that basically kept the river format banks and uh, depth relatively the same so that's interesting uh, it's a three mile stretch of river uh, running uh, varies between 50 and 100 feet wide uh, and it's, it, much of it is dry nowadays in, in high summer the river reach uh, itself is only 20 feet wide and fairly shallow uh, let's see here and that so there, there certainly is a difference in the depth today because of irrigation and damming and things like that but basically the the author of this article is suggesting that even without the damming that the river would not have been for instance uh, hip depth or anything like that all right so then uh, we can get into let's talk a little bit more about the riverbank here uh, Alexander may have been quite right to disparage the river itself as a little stream but the riverbanks at first sight appear to, to pose significant problems just as Parmenian had warned for the modern visitor have um, for modern visitors have observed that the riverbed takes the form of a wide trough with about with sides up to 13 feet or four meters high closer inspection however reveals that as the granicus twists and turns on its leisurely uh, northeastern journey to the sea at every bend it has gradual deposit layers of sandy gravel which could be formed form broad and gentle slopes so Although the height of the banks would afford an obvious advantage to the defender, positioned there to repel an attack who was forced to climb, clamber up the riverbed below, nevertheless the formation of those gravel slopes provides a series of ramps to assist the attacker both uh, entering and exiting the riverbed, making it a far less daunting task. So the article then moves on to discuss the Persian battle line, and we'll have a, a look at that now. Uh, no source exists for the Persian battles, uh, sorry, the Persian units in detail, but it is interesting to note that if Aryan's 20,000 cavalry were drawn up eight, eight deep, and if we were to allow a two yard or 1.8 meter frontage, then the battle line would extend for almost three miles <clears throat> or four and a half kilometers, which is uh, the length of, uh, let's just see here. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, which is the length, the distance that I mentioned earlier on, uh, approximately three miles from this uh, river junction here down to the marsh. So we can imagine these forces may have been arrayed over quite a distance. Let's see. So there's also certainly some argument about whether or not the Persian cavalry were formed up against the the banks or would have been more sensibly set back to facilitate a charge and i think that and in the article here it also talks about it a little bit uh, the these are primarily light cavalry and as you can see if you can see these counters that have a little j on them right uh, they're all javelin armed they're armed with and uh, there are even archers in here uh, they're armed with uh, light throwing weapons so the advantage for them is to throw from the banks down onto the enemy and then perhaps engage them with swords or whatever the case may be versus the a charge perhaps similar to what alexander may have done uh, with uh, his in parentheses his heavy cavalry of the day uh, right so uh, the traditional cavalry charge that we all think of so there is some logic behind the Persian battle line being pushed up against the river edge and um, and why they chose that as a tactic because they're generally speaking a lighter armed and armored force than than the Greeks all right uh, this does go on for another couple of uh, paragraphs here but let's just see Okay, so then the, the uh, author then here uh, gives a, a nod to Arian's authority as a military thinker who had governed and armed a province of the Roman Empire and had written a treatise on cavalry tactics, no less. Okay, the composition of the cavalry, uh, and this then talks about what I was uh, saying about uh, the, uh, 
the Persian cavalry being not being heavy lances, but rather these uh, uh, more lightly armed javelin throwing type troops. And so we could see that uh, that would be probably be effective to be up on the bank several feet above the heavily armored Macedonian troops trying to cross across the river. All right. The Macedonian battle line. Uh, naturally, Arian uh, had more detailed information about the Macedonian forces, and he went on. Uh, there's a quote here from the uh, uh, from uh, Arian that outlines the different units of uh, Macedonian troops and where Alexander was and his companion forces, and the different phalanxes of forces in Parmenian over on the far right hand side. Sorry, the the left hand left flank of uh, Alexander's line, but uh, clearly the right-hand side of the map here for us as we're looking at it. So no need to go into that in much more detail because you can see it all here and we'll see some close-ups later on. There is some uh, discrediting of Arian's uh, commentary because he mentions uh, multiple Phillips and multiple uh, Craterises. Uh, in in the lineup, and they therefore uh, some historians have tried to use that as a discrediting uh, the level of detail. The article goes into extreme uh, it goes to extreme lengths to uh, rationalize that and explain that away. And there's probably no need for us to uh, dig into that level of detail here, unless uh, unless someone's interested, and then I can share these segments online for you to have a look at. I encourage you to go buy the magazine. It's pretty interesting stuff. All right, so we've got, uh, talks about the right wing and uh, forces being arrayed and Ptolemy's forces and Diodorus gives some totals of infantry and cavalry. All right, Macedonian strategy. Alexander's conspicuous position on the far right gives us a clue to his strategy for seeing that for seeing that the Persian cavalry meant to turn the, the riverbed into a killing zone Picking off the Macedonian phalanx as they struggled across, Alexander seems to have evolved a cunning plan to draw them off their vantage point and into combat. Into combat. And there's a quote here from Arian directly that says, uh, quote, Then Alexander, uh, leaping onto his horse and urging those nearby to follow him and show themselves true men, ordered the scouts and uh, the Paeonian uh, under Amentus, son of Arabias, to charge into the river with one infantry battalion following the lead of the squadron of, of Socrates, led by Ptolemy, son of Philip. And that's uh, 1.14.6 from Arium. Almost a century ago, the German scholar uh, Walter Judek, following the classic analysis of Rustow and Kolke, go figure, uh, suggested that Alexander's opening gambit delivered by light cavalry supported it would seem, by the shield bearers standing next in, uh, next in line, was to drive obliquely upriver against the Persian left wing. Most scholars who express an opinion on the matter have followed this scheme. <clears throat> Although there is nothing in the ancient accounts to support it, Bosworth, on the other hand, finds it quite untenable. But as we have seen, he does prefer Diodorus's version. All right, so there we go where uh, this was a uh, battle that was fought on the plain, east of the river, according to Diodorus. Nevertheless, he's probably quite correct to, to question the direction of the attack, although for the wrong reasons, as we shall see. Meanwhile, Arian's subsequent narrative reveals Alexander's strategy, for it is clear that the preliminary maneuvers were was not, as uh, these other authors thought, to establish a bridgehead, nor was it to create confusion amongst the Persians, or nor was it to lure the Persians right up to the edge of the riverbank. For that it was... For that it, excuse me, for that is where they already stood. And it surely was not to stem the charge of the Persian cavalry from the foothills. Uh, that's uh, quoting Bosworth there. For this is Diodorus's faulty version of events. In fact, we can see that the maneuver was intended to draw the Persians from the positions on, uh, of strength down into the riverbed. And in, in this, it succeeded. Uh, then we quote Arian again, quote, where the first troops those with Amentus and Socrates, touched the bank. The person shot at them from above, some hurling javelins into the river, from the bank others descending to the lower ground at the water's edge. There was a shoving match between the two cavalries, one emerging from the river, the other barring the way, and a dense shower of javelins hurled by the Persians. 
while the Macedonians, far outnumbered, suffered in the first assault, they were defending themselves from a low and insecure position in the river, whereas the Persians were assailing them from above. And that's 115.1 uh, and 2. Alexander's master stroke, and here we go. After several minutes, it seems, Alexander judged that it was time to unleash his formidable companions on the unsuspecting Persians, and in the words of Plutarch, he plunged into the stream with 13 squadrons of cavalry, and Arian explains that, uh, quote, as he went, he kept stretching out his line diagonal to the direction <clears throat> of the current so that the Persians might not attack the flank of his column as he climbed out of the river. And so here we can see, uh, to paraphrase what's coming next, that uh, Arian is talking about uh, Alexander coming in at this angle versus this angle. This angle will be upriver, this angle will be downriver, and so he'd be, uh, Alexander came in coming with the, with the stream, I believe, with the current. I believe that's what we're talking about here. So uh, Arian's uh, Greek text literally describes continually extending his formation diagonally where the stream was pulling, which Hammond, another writer, uh, refers to translate as upstream to the right. This would mean that they rode against the current towards the confluence with the uh, Coca Kai, uh, K, uh, which seems rather unlikely. On the contrary, the direction of Alexander's maneuver is usually interpreted as downstream, which ought to call into question uh, another author's uh, upstream uh, commentary, basically, uh, by uh, Amentus's strike force. Uh, another author, Hal, is on the is the only commenter. K commentator to draw attention to this problem, pointing out that the two forces crossed each other's line of attack somehow, avoiding collision. Uh, to assault, let's see, yes, uh, to assault uh, different objectives. His solution is to have both forces moving in the same direction, obliquely downstream. However, it is not the, the direction of Alexander's attack that was diagonally across the river, but the development or evolution of his formation, which kept stretching out as it crossed the river, the river bed. Firstly, the targets of Alexander's, Alexander's attack were not the Persians further downstream, but the left wing at the point where the mass of their cavalry had been posted and where the Persian commanders had been stationed. Uh, so perhaps somewhere in this area here, we can see there's two leaders here. The strongest contingent of the Persian cavalry is, is precisely where uh, he struck. And secondly, the reason for the maneuver so that the companions would not present a vulnerable flank to the, to the Persians, but would meet their battle line face on like a phalanx, shows that it was most definitely a gradual fanning out and not a complete change of direction. Meanwhile, uh, Amintas' uh, uh, combined cavalry and infantry strike force had accomplished their goal, having taken the full weight of the enemy attack upon themselves and having created some disorder by drawing the frontmost Persians down the gravel slopes into the riverbed, those who had not been cut down were now wheeled back, now wheeled back towards Alexander as he approached. 1.15.3 from Arian. Uh, we might imagine that they passed through the ranks of the companions towards the rear in order to regroup there. Then there's a long quote here from Arian. Uh, quote, uh, a fierce battle was joined around Alexander. And meanwhile, unit after unit of Macedonians succeeded in crossing the river with no difficulty. Though the battle was fought on horseback, it looked more like an infantry engagement in a confined space, horses contended with horses and men with men. The Macedonians trying to drive the Persians from the bank and force them into the plain. The Persians trying to deny the Macedonians a foothold and thrust them back uh, to the river. And in this struggle, excuse me, and in this struggle, Alexander and his men gained the upper hand not only because of their strength and experience, but because of their uh, because they used Cornell wood spears against the Persian light javelins. And that was Arian one fifteen four through five. So Arian concentrates on Alexander's involvement, leaving events further downriver unmentioned. Diodorus alleges that the Thessalian cavalry at any rate saw some action, and Plutarch notes that the Macedonian phalanxes crossed the river and the infantry forces joined battle. And that comes from uh, Alexander 16.6. .6. All three ancient sources describe the king's epic duel with three eminent Persians, Mithridates, 
and the brothers Rosasis and Spitridates. Apologies for the uh, pronunciation there. One of uh, whom seems to have been King Darius's son-in-law. And the crucial involvement, of course, of Cletus the Black, who saved Alexander's life by cutting off one of the brothers' sword arms in the nick of time. Finally, the Persians, quote, uh, Arian uh, gave way first where Alexander was bearing the brunt of the battle when their center collapsed. Both cavalry wings also broke and a desperate flight began. Nearly a thousand uh, Persian horsemen died. Arian 1, 16, 1 through 2. Bardian, another author, ends his article pessimistically in the belief that we cannot make up for the basic inadequacy of the main source. And he's quite correct, uh, according to this author, uh, that a detailed blow-by-blow narrative of the battle is now beyond recovery, given uh, how much of these were destroyed. Uh, however, in our modern appreciation of the battlefield, combined with uh, proper regard for Arian's accuracy over Diodorus's mislocated version, this gives us an inkling of what happened at the River Granicus. Uh, so that's an article by Dr. Duncan B. Campbell. Let's see if I missed anything there. I think that was what I, all I wanted to share with you. So what we will do here is uh, attempt to do somewhat of a recreation of this particular battle and give you a look and feel for uh, Alexander's efforts and his, his cavalry and his uh, screening forces that may, uh, so it'll be uh, these guys, these two forces here, these two cavalry units, the lancers and these light cav, along with some of these uh, skirmishers perhaps, and we will advance them up and engage with the river, and then we'll have uh, Alexander come and attack in on this angle here. And of course, in the meantime, we'll... Uh, that's four dogs racing around up on my deck. My apologies. <laughs> they sound very excited. Uh, we'll obviously have these phalanxes advance and uh, attempt to threaten the center. And we'll get Parmenian in on the action as well and threaten this flank at the same time as well. And in the meantime, we'll uh, see what we can do with the with the Persians, we won't just necessarily let them languish, but we'll obey the uh, one of the three or four different scenarios for the Battle of Granicus. We'll obey the scenario, obey the scenario rules, <coughs> and uh, and see what happens with this. And if there's uh, uh, enough time and interest on my part, we'll uh, we'll look at some other versions of the battle as well. So there you have it. I know that's rather a long video but I thought you might appreciate uh, getting a little contextual background to this battle uh, given its uh, notability in history. All the best.